بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد. Tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be reflecting on 25 benefits or lessons that we gain from Surah Al-Fatiha. And the number 25, inshallah ta'ala, don't let it scare you because inshallah we're going to go through them quickly, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to spend maybe a minute to two reflecting on each of these benefits. And these benefits, we're not going to go through an in-depth tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And we're just going to go through some of the tadabburs, some of the reflections that I gathered from different scholars who made the reflection in the tadabbur on Surah Al-Fatiha and I found very beneficial. So I gathered what I could from them and translated them into English. Some of them, alhamdulillah, uh, from my own tadabbur, but very little. Most are from our scholars. I just complied them uh, to benefit myself and to benefit the brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala. As soon as you open up Surah Al-Fatiha, and Surah Al-Fatiha is amazing, my brothers and sisters, because it's, it's a, such a small surah, but it's so powerful. It's powerful in its meanings. It's powerful in its impact on the reader. It's powerful as a ruqya. All of this we know from the sunnah. And there's no excuse for any Muslim to not be able to read Surah Al-Fatiha correctly. Because as we know from the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the prayer is not accepted unless... We read Surah Al-Fatiha, meaning we read it correctly. So there's no excuse for any Muslim not knowing how to read Surah Al-Fatiha correctly. And after that, we read it a minimum, how many times a day? What is the minimum amount of times that we read Surah Al-Fatiha every day? 17 times, that's the minimum. That's if you don't pray the sunnahs, you just pray the fard. 17 times a day. But yet many Muslims still don't know the meanings and that's not acceptable i don't know arabic still not acceptable go online go home tonight and open up quran.com they have you'll see on, on the side the word for word meanings go through each word you have to know what each word means alhamdu what does it mean rub what does it mean huh al alamin what does it mean ihdina what does it mean ghayr what does it mean any single word in Surah Al-Fatiha, you have to understand its meaning. And then when you start to understand its meanings, tonight we add to that the issue of the tadabbur and reflecting on those meanings. As soon as you open up Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that all of the hamd is only for Him. And linguistically, in the Arabic language, Al-Hamd is deeper than the shukr. Shukr is the thanks. But the hamd is even a greater form of shukr. All of this is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah describes to us who He is. That He's Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of the worlds. He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the eternal merciful, especially merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Malik Yawm deen the owner of the day of recompense subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this puts into our heart the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these meanings, these beautiful names, these attributes. It fills our hearts with the greatness of Allah. And how does this impact us in our lives? It impacts us, it impacts us when it comes to implementing the commands that we've been commanded to do. It makes it easier for us. It makes it easier for us to stay away from the things that we're told us to stay away from. Because this is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm Ad-Din, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When you look at the wisdom of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim coming immediately after Rabbil Alameen, when you reflect on the meanings of Rabbil Alameen, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the Rabb, the one who owns everything you see from the creation, the one who created and the one who owns it, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That puts a bit of fear into the heart how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so right after that enters into your heart Allah says to us ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to show us the mercy and the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to fill our hearts not just with a type of fear but a type of hope as well and these two names 
Ar Rahman Ar Rahim are the names that open up the widest doors of hope and love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fact that they come from the same root in the Arabic language, this shows us how vast Allah's mercy really is. They come from the same root of the rahmah, the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but each one has this unique meaning. And that shows us how vast the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. The pillars of worship in Islam, if a worship is going to be correct, if we want to properly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be built upon three pillars. And that is, first of all, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then hope and fear. And if we don't have these three components or these three pillars, you cannot properly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why some of the scholars, they describe these components, they gave the example of the bird. The bird is made up of what? What are the main components of the body of the bird? The body itself, and then what? The two wings. So they said the body of the bird, this is the love. The love that we have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the two wings are the hope and the fear. Can a bird fly with one wing? It's not possible. Therefore, there has to be the balance. We, it all starts with the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and filling our heart with the love. Once our heart is filled with the love, then we have hope from Allah, and then we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. And that's how we create the balance in our worship. And if one of them is more, if the hope is more, we fall into what? We can more easily fall into sin. But if we have the balance with the hope and the fear, and it starts, the actions start from loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we're going to find that our worship is going to be correct, and we're going to have that balance when it comes to our worship. Malik yawm al-Din, a very small verse, but it contains so many meanings. It confirms for us, when we reflect on the meaning, the resurrection, that we're going to be resurrected, to be held accountable yawm al-Qiyamah. And also, the recompense for all of our actions, good and bad. You're going to be held accountable for all that you did. And you're going to be judged. And Allah alone, He will be the authority. He will be the judge on that day, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that true justice will be established through Allah's rule on that day. All of these meanings fall under a small verse in the Quran, Malik Yawm al-Din. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahu Allah, he mentioned that he was reflecting on what is the most beneficial dua. And pay attention to this meaning. He said, I was reflecting what is the most beneficial dua that we can make. And he said, I found that it's asking Allah's help to do that which is pleasing for him. The most beneficial dua is asking Allah for his help, asking for Allah's help to do that which is pleasing to Allah. And then he said, then I looked into Surah Al-Fatiha and I saw, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُودُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ That's the meaning. The same meaning. We seek Allah's help, His assistance to do that which is pleasing to Him, which is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One might ask a question, and that is, why is the isti'ana which is seeking the assistance and the help from Allah, we say, and we seek your help. Why is it mentioned after, only you we worship, when the isti'ana, or seeking Allah's assistance, it's a form of ibadah, it's a form of worship in itself. So why would you mention the worship and then just mention a part of the worship? Think of that. Because it's included in worship itself. So why, do we mention, why did Allah mention it after it? And that is because we need Allah's help to worship Him properly. We need Allah's help and His assistance to do that which He has commanded us to do. We need Allah's help and His assistance to stay away from that which He forbid us from doing. And if we don't have Allah's help, we're not going to be able to do it. And that's why we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ When it comes to asking Allah for His help, we need Allah's help in three main areas. 
as Imam Ibn Rajib al hanbali rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned. We need his help to perform the ma'murat, to perform the things that we've been commanded to do. And we need his help and his assistance and staying away from the mahdurat, the things that we've been forbidden from doing. And we need his help when it comes to having patience from the maqdurat, having patience for the maqdurat, the things from the qadr. Our belief as Muslims when it comes to the qadr, the, the divine decree is that we believe in it, the good and evil which comes from it. Therefore, we need Allah's assistance because not everything in life is going to come how we want it to come. Not everything's going to happen how it planned. SubhanAllah, I was planning a program with my family and just before the, I received, you might have heard my phone ring in the salat. I always put it on silent. I forgot today. It rang and I turned off the phone. After the salat, everything we had planned went wrong because we were supposed to have a piece of paper, uh, some documents that didn't finish today. My family got a bit upset. We said, Alhamdulillah, Qadrullah. It wasn't planned to be. And so Muslim always trains himself, say Qadrullah when something happens. Perhaps the good, inshallah, is in a delay, inshallah, ta'ala. Our original plan wasn't good for us. So Alhamdulillah, it's all good, Alhamdulillah. No need to get upset. So here, we need Allah's assistance to do these three things in these three main areas. To do what we're commanded to do, stay away from what we've been forbidden from, and when the Qadr comes as well, that we have patience. Then he said, Rahimullah ta'ala, Imam Ibn Rajib, that we need Allah's help when it comes in this, in this life and when we die and in dealing with the horrors and the difficulties of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So the assistance that we're asking Allah for, it doesn't stop in this life. We need the assistance of Allah at the time of death. How is that, Ya Khan? How do we need Allah's assistance at the time of death? Huh? To maintain your iman and to say what? La ilaha illallah at the time of death. It's not easy like you think. Like you think I'm just going to say it. It's difficult. Also you need it when you're placed into your grave. When the angels come and ask you the three questions. What are you going to be asked? Who's your Rabb? Who's your Lord? Uh, who's your messenger? And what, was your, who's your, what is your religion? In order to answer correctly, we need the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Imam Ibn Rajab, he said that whoever is successful in fulfilling these things in this life, meaning what he's supposed to be doing, stay away from what he's supposed to stay away from, and he has patience and sabr when it comes to the qadr, that Allah sub is going to make it easy for him in this life and then make it easy for him in the hereafter as well. Those who strive to act upon la ilaha illallah, those who strive to act upon iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, and they work hard for it. Allah is going to help them in this life and he's going to help them when they die at the time of death when they're put into their grave and he's going to help them Yawm Al-Qiyamah. May Allah make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The most beneficial things for one's heart is the Tawheed and the Tawakkul. The Tawheed, pure Islamic monotheism, pure La ilaha illallah, and the Tawakkul relying upon Allah. And the most harmful thing for the heart is the shirk and then the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at iyyaka na'budu, that is the tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Wa iyyaka nasta'een, this is the tawakkul, the reliance. So for the most beneficial things for our heart, it's included in this ayah. And when these two things fill your heart, the pure tawheed and the tawakkul, the re pure reliance on Allah, there's nothing stronger for your hearts. There's nothing more beneficial in helping you deal with the difficulties and any of the challenges that you will be facing. Two of the most dangerous, dangerous diseases of the hearts are that of a riya and al kibr. Riya, which is to show off, to do things for others. And the kibr, the arrogance or the pride. And this verse, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, it cures both of them. Iyaka na'bud, it cures the riya. Showing off or doing something for other than Allah. Iyaka na'bud. Only you, Ya Allah, we worship. We don't do anything from our actions for anyone else. Wa nasta'een. Only your assistance, Ya Allah. Only your help we seek. This what? It shows us, it teaches us to be humble. It teaches us our need of Allah. Therefore, it cures any type of kibr, any type of arrogance. Obtaining the tawfiq 
and the success in this life and in the next, it only comes from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's training us daily. 17 times a day, a minimum as we said. Training us to seek the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we seek the assistance, it reminds us only Allah can make us successful. Only Allah can make us successful. And this is what this ayah is training us to do. Surah Al-Fatiha is a surah of tarbiyah, training the Muslim of how we need to believe, of how we need to think, of what we need to fill our hearts with. The impact of this surah, when you truly understand it, and the impact of this ayah in particular, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ is absolutely amazing. And that's why you look into the stories of the scholars who understood the meanings. How إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ impacted them. Muzahib ibn Zafar, he said that Sufyan Athori, rahimahullah, he led us in prayer. And when he reached Surah Al- uh, and reading Surah Al-Fatiha, when he reached إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ he started to cry. Why did he cry? He understood the meaning, the true meanings. It's not just like we're doing now just to get to the end of the surah. Just in a hurry to get and finish and just read the namaz and get it done, get it over with. Another one in the book. We did what we have to do. He understood the meaning. That's why when he reached it impacted him right away. He started to cry so much so he had to go back to the beginning of the surah and start over again from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Muhammad ibn Awf al-Himsi, he said that he saw Ahmed ibn Abi al-Hawari praying. And when he reached, he continued to walk around the building where he was praying. Later he came back, shortly after, and he said, I found he was still reading, he hadn't left the ayah. He said, then I left and I went to sleep. He came back in the morning time, before Fajr, and he said he was still reading, the entire night. He reflected on its meanings. He stopped. The entire night he kept reading the ayah. That's how much it impacted him. And don't think when you hear these stories, oh, these were the, the salaf. These were the early generations of the Muslims. During our times, one of the scholars mentioned that he prayed, prayed one of the scholars who was from our times, Sheikh Abdurrahman al-Dosri rahimullah. He passed away now. He said that every time we would pray with him in his masjid and he would read, he would be the imam, that he would have trouble reading Surah Al-Fatiha without crying. Especially when it came to Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. When you truly understand the meanings of this ayah, how amazing it is. And that's why Imam Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his book, Madarj Salikin, which is translated as the Stations of the Seekers, which is the tafsir of this ayah only, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, and printed in four volumes. Four volumes, that's how deep this ayah is. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. This surah is amazing. This ayah is very deep. SubhanAllah, even recently, one of the scholars sent me a book that he wrote about the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and about 400 pages. Just Surah Al-Fatiha, SubhanAllah. And here Imam al Qayyim, just on this ayah, four volumes, Allah Akbar. There's many of the adab of dua in Surah Al-Fatiha. In Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, we learn that putting what Allah loves first is from the adab of dua before we ask for something from Allah. Putting what Allah loves first, putting what Allah loves first, and then asking Allah. Iyaka Na'budu, this is Allah's right to be worshipped. This is what Allah loves from us, is to worship Him and to obey Him. And then we, then we ask for the assistance. Then we ask for the help. And we see a similar meaning when you come to the dua of Ihdina. O oh Allah, guide us to Asirat al Mustaqim. What is from the adab? Praising Allah. The surah, surah al- they call it Surah Al Hamd. So the surah of praise. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is the praising Allah. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, praising Allah. Malik Yawm Ad-Din, praising Allah. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. This is the covenant between us and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 
to have pure tawheed, to only return to Allah, only to seek His assistance, only to worship Him. And then we come with the dua. Ihdina. This is from the adab. When we make dua, we're always in a hurry. Oh Allah, I need this. Oh Allah, new car. Oh Allah, new wife. Huh? It's just, <laughs> this is the, it's, it's right away, give, 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 give. Oh Allah, give. What about praising Allah? If you look at the, how the Prophet used to make dua, he would start praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you come and you ask. Ask for what you want. Anything, alhamdulillah. From the sunnah, Allah, the Prophet taught us, even if you want to fix the strap on your shoe, it's broken, you want to fix it. Make dua for, 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 for help with your shoes. No problem. Whatever you, is in, in your mind. But let's have adab. We make dua. And this is what Surah Al-Fatiha is, is training us to do. Making tarbiyah of us. To have adab with Allah. Manners with Allah. Praise Allah first. Be thankful for the blessings of Allah first. And then ask. From the dua, from the greatest forms of dua, we mentioned asking Allah's assistance to do that which is pleasing to Him. Another beneficial and greatest forms of dua is also found in this ayah, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. And that is because if you are guided to the Sirat al Mustaqim, if you're guided to the straight path, then Allah is going to assist you and help you in obeying Him and to refraining and in refraining from that which is haram and displeasing to Allah. And if we are able to accomplish this, nothing will harm us in this life or in the next, inshallah ta'ala. But it starts with receiving the assistance and receiving, having the ability, the tawfiq, to follow the straight path. One might ask, why do we ask why do we ask Allah to guide us 17 times a day? And we've already been guided. Meaning we're Muslims, alhamdulillah. The one who stands up and prays five times a day, he's a Muslim, he's been guided, alhamdulillah. So why do we continue to always ask for guidance? It's important that you understand there's two types of guidance. The guidance which is known as, the, or the hidayah, which is known as the hidayah of Dalala, which is to show the way. And the second form is that of a tawfiq, which is the success to follow the way. So being shown the way is only part of it. The next step is to what? Is to follow and act upon it. So alhamdulillah, we've been guided to the correct path. But now we need Allah's assistance to follow it. And that's why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the importance of knowing the meanings. Ya Allah, ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeem. Help us to follow the Sirat al-Mustaqeem. And when you say, Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, what are you asking Allah? It's important to realize this. There's three main things that we're asking Allah. Three main core meanings when we say, Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem. And that is, first of all, Allah, first say, Yo, oh Allah, guide us to that path. That's the first thing we're asking. Guide us to the Sirat al-Mustaqeem. Because as we know, even as Muslims, there's a lot of paths out there. A lot of paths. Therefore, we want to be guided to the one correct straight path. That's the first thing we're asking. Then the second thing, after we're guided to that path, that Allah helps us with the tawfiq and the ability to travel along that path. To go down that path. To act upon the teachings of that path. That's the second thing we're asking Allah. And the third thing, we're saying, Oh Allah, Help keep us firm on this path. First of all, to be guided to the path and then to act upon the teachings of the path and travel down it and then to stay firm on it and to die upon it, inshallah ta'ala. The success in this life will equal the success in the hereafter when it comes to another sirat. Because sirat al-mustaqim in this life is following the straight path that Allah has ordered us to follow. And stay away from the subul, from the path that Allah warned us to stay away from. And the hereafter, there's another sirat. What is the sirat of the hereafter? The sirat, the bridge that will go over the hellfire. What is this description? As thin as a hair and as sharp as a sword. Each one of us will travel across it according to his deeds in this dunya. If you're from the people who strive for Allah, night and day, doing as much good as possible, stay away from the haram, you'll travel, inshallah, at the speed of light. Some will run, some will walk, some will crawl, and some will eventually fall into the hellfire. May Allah safeguard us. 
So your crossing of that sirat will be determined by your deeds and your actions and how you used to strive in this dunya. You see the importance of the dua that we're making now? al mustaqim. You see how deep the meanings are? When it comes to the sirat al-mustaqim, when we ask for it so many times a day, also this teaches us, when we reflect on it, the nature of the path. And the nature of the path is that it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. And this is the reality of anything in life. Being successful in anything. If you want to be a doctor, you have to study longer, study more. From the time you're in high school, not from the time when you're in university, because you can't get accepted if you don't have the highest marks. Therefore, you have to work harder than other people if you want to be a doctor. If you want to be a successful businessman, if you want to be fit and ripped and cut, all of that takes discipline. All of it is hard work. So the nature of the Sirat al-Mustaqim, it's going to be difficult. But what is the end result? Jannah. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pleased with you entering into Jannah. Therefore, it reminds us, when we keep asking for it constantly, that nature of the path, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. Why did Allah mention after the Sirat al-Mustaqim, Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim? God is to the straight path, the path of those whom you have bestowed the path, those who have bestowed your favor. Why did Allah mention this right after it? As an example to us to remind us of what is the straight path. Because if you want to know what is the straight path, you need to know who are those who traveled down the straight path in the past and who are those who are traveling down the straight path in this life. Allah described those who he bestowed his favor on in the verse in Surah An-Nisa. الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءُ وَالصَّالِحِينَ These four people, these four groups or indi of individuals, these are the ones who Allah has bestowed his favor on. These are the ones who have followed to the straight path throughout history. They are the prophets and the Siddiqeen, which are the ones who are stead the steadfast and firmers to truth. And the shuhada, those who fought and were martyred in the path of Allah. And the salihin, the righteous and pious. It's a reminder that these are the ones who have followed the path, an example of who they are. And also it's a reminder to us so we're not lonely when you travel the path. Because the reality as the Prophet wasallam told us that those who come to implement Islam at the end of time, he described them as ghuraba, strangers. And we can see that in the time that we, the time that we live in. Those who want to act upon Islam, he's gharib, he's strange. You want to implement the sunnah and stay away from certain things, gharib, it's strange. People look at you as being a strange individual, you're a stranger. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet said, Tuba al ghuraba give glad tidings to the ghuraba those who are the strangers those who hold a firm hold firm to their deen alhamdulillah we have glad tidings from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in this verse as well it gives us glad tidings it reassures us we know that we're following the path of the prophets and we're following the path of those who are the truthful ones and those who are the martyrs and those who are from the salihin from the pious and righteous alhamdulillah so we don't feel lonely even if we're by ourselves that only a few of us following that path we're following the path of the ones who Allah an'am Allahu alayhim, the ones who have Allah has bestowed his favor on. May Allah make us from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. In an'amta, you have bestowed your favor on. In this verse, this teaches us, reminds us that Allah, the hidayah is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can only show people to the path, but true hidayah is only from Allah. And also that hidayah is from the greatest blessings. An'amta. Just an'amta reminds us of the great blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us if we are from those who are rightfully guided. When you look at the tafsir, the tafsir that almost all of the Muslims know, who are the maghdubi alayhim, those who Allah has invoked his anger on? And who are the dalin, those who have gone astray? What is the tafsir that we know? 
talking about the Jews and the Christians, the Jews, the ones Allah has invoked his anger on because they knew it was the truth. They were in Medina, migrated to Medina because the description of Medina was in their books. They knew that the prophet, the last prophet sent to mankind would be in an area with this description. They knew they were in the right place. But when he was sent from the Arab and not from them, from Bani Israel, they rejected the truth even though they knew it was the truth. And even in today, when you sit with many of them, they say, we know Islam is the truth. Even till today, many of them open up and tell you. But they refuse to follow it out of arrogance and pride. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invoked his anger upon them. When you look at the Christians, they worship Allah, but they worship on ignorance. For over 300 years, they, have no, they don't know where their book was. Then it was compiled 300 plus years later, and they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that which is distorted from their religion. Religion always being changed. Principles. And we see many examples in the days we live in of principles that are changed. Things that were haram and now they accept it. They change it to suit the times that they live in. This is a form of ignorance in the worship of Allah. But it's important to understand in this verse that it doesn't only mean them. The true objective of this verse is to warn us to not fall into the trap. Don't be from those who know the truth and don't act upon it. And don't be from those who worship Allah based on ignorance. This is the true objective of the ayah. Because many times we know the tafsir of it being from the people of the book. Therefore, we don't focus on ourselves. What's more important for me when I read this ayah is to make sure that I do not reject the truth and I don't act upon the truth while I know it or that I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through ignorance. This is the main objective I'm trying to learn from this ayah. And that's why the ayah is general. It's a general ayah. So hey, this is the meaning. From the meanings is correct. The tafsir we mentioned. But there's also a general tafsir that anyone who rejects the truth when he knows it and refuses to act upon it, he falls into the category of the maghdubi alayhim. And those who worship Allah through ignorance and many of the bid'ah and the innovation that you see around the Islamic world today, it's because they follow the path of a dalin. They worship the law through ignorance. It shows us two of the main reasons for going astray from the straight path. We ask Allah, Then we say, Then Allah, save us from the path of those who have what? Gone astray. Those who have gone astray from the truth. Those who have know the truth and they've rejected it. Help us stay away from, the, from the, the, that path as well, Ya Allah. And this shows us that those who have gone astray, it's due to either arrogance or ignorance. So the two, me, two main reasons of going astray is from arrogance or ignorance. And also this reminds us that this path is a path to Jahannam. The path of arrogance and the path of ignorance is a path to Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invoked his anger on these individuals. And the 25th, Lesson and benefit, if you are counting, inshallah ta'ala. This verse, غَيْرُ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمُ الضَّالِينَ is a reminder to us to stay away from imitating and following the paths of those who have rejected the truth and don't act upon it and those who worship Allah through ignorance. To not imitate the way of the disbelievers. The Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, he said, Man minhum. Whoever imitates a nation, that he's from them. Be careful, beware. And from the meanings of غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمُ الْضَّالِينَ is to remind us that if you want to be from those who follow Sirat al-Mustaqeem, the straight path, you want to be from those who are successful in this life and the next, you have to be unique. You have to be proud of who you are as a Muslim. You have to act upon La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah have to put into action. Has to be put into action. And you have to stay away from those paths which you go astray, those paths that will guide you to Jahannam. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammad.